In the last video, we discussed randomization variation. Randomization variation motivates a type of test we do to try to determine whether the effects we've seen in a randomized experiment demonstrate real treatment differences or whether they could just be the luck of the draw. In the last video, we saw how randomly labeling some people as belonging to group A and others to group B produces differences in the means of these purely artificial groups. When the group sizes are comparatively small, as in this example, the differences in group means that we observe can be quite large, despite the fact that there's no underlying true difference at all. This data comes from a randomized experiment to investigate the effect of sleep deprivation on performance on a visual learning task. Subjects in the group labeled deprived experienced some sleep deprivation, while those in the group labeled unrestricted were able to sleep normally. The outcome variable was an improvement in a score on a particular type of test of visual learning over a three-day period. Here are the mean test scores for each group. And the difference? It looks like the unrestricted group is doing quite a bit better, which would imply that sleep deprivation leads to reduced scores. But then we remember this. Could what we're seeing here just be due to this, the luck of the draw, Maybe the sleep deprivation is not making any real difference at all. Maybe all we're seeing is one of these pure luck-of-the-draw differences from the randomization. If randomization luck on its own can do this, we're going to need to see something bigger in our experimental data before we'll believe that the experimental data provides evidence of a treatment effect, here that sleep deprivation causes reductions in test scores. Sound like common sense? That's the basic thinking behind a statistical significance test, or statistical hypothesis test. In situations where the effect I see in experimental data could quite easily be produced by the randomization alone, then the experimental evidence doesn't prove anything to me. It could all just be due to chance. I'd need to see something bigger. So how do we turn this basic idea into the randomization test? We'll use VIT's randomization test module to develop the ideas. We begin with the real data from the experiment, which involves real treatment groups. We think, maybe sleep deprivation makes no difference, and the difference in means we see is just due to randomization. Well, if sleep deprivation made no difference, then it wouldn't matter what treatment people got. The results would have been the same. So we'll strip the treatment labels and colors off everyone. How big are the differences we'd get from pure random reassignment, just by the luck of the draw? We'll randomly form new groups. There were 11 people in the sleep deprivation group and 10 in the unrestricted group. So we'll randomly put green deprived labels on 11 of them and red unrestricted labels on the rest. Now we'll pull them apart into their artificial groups and look at the difference between their means. Let's do this again. Strip the labels off, randomly relabel, pull them apart into two new randomization groups, look at the difference in means. We'll do this 20 times and compare the differences random reassignment is producing to the 15.92 we got in the experiment. I think all of those were smaller. Let's do it again. Most look smaller, but a couple were about as big as the real one from the experiment. Now let's do it a large number of times and keep track of all the results. We keep a track of the lengths of the arrows just as we did with the randomization variation module. Now let's do it a thousand times. Okay, the dot plot has recorded all the differences we've got from a thousand re-randomizations. So how does the real one from the experiment compare with what we got by forming artificial groups randomly? Here the real group difference, 15.92, is laid on top of the ones we got by randomizing, the ones we got just by the luck of the draw. Well, it's clear that randomization alone hardly ever gives us anything as big as 15.92. We'll ask for the tail proportion to see how rare this is. It tells us that the luck of the draw gave us 15.92 or bigger 10 times out of 1,000. That's 1% 1 of the time. Put another way, random reassignment almost always gave us values smaller than this. 
99% of the time they were smaller. Since randomization variation almost always gives differences smaller than we got from this experiment, I'd be prepared to rule out the luck of the draw as the plausible explanation and conclude that in this experiment, sleep deprivation really did lead to a reduction in visual learning test scores. Let's expand on this logic. We want to compare the real difference in the data with all the differences generated by re-randomizing. We'll look at several scenarios of what might happen. Here, the luck of the randomization draw quite often produces differences even bigger than the one from our data. In the second one, re-randomization hardly ever produces a difference this big. They're almost always smaller. And in this last one, re-randomization never produces a difference this big. What can we conclude from that? In this top one, the luck of the randomization drawer alone can easily make differences even bigger than this. There's no evidence that there's a real difference between the groups. At the bottom, the luck of the randomization draw can't make something that big. We have conclusive evidence that there's a real difference. But what about the middle one? Re-randomization hardly ever makes differences that big, so surely we have some sort of evidence of a true difference. Let's think about intermediate cases. At the top, we're simply not interested. The data proves nothing. At the bottom, there's a clear result. The researchers should have our full attention. But in between, at what point would we start to get interested, to really start to sit up and take notice? Conventionally, people start concluding something real has probably happened if the tail proportion is about 5% or smaller. In this case, randomization alone would seldom give values this big. 19 times out of 20, it'd be smaller. There are a number of important subtleties about interpreting tail proportions. Formerly, they're called p-values. There are also some really bad consequences of a rigid application of the 5% cutoff as a gold standard for having proved something. We'll address these in articles to follow. That brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, we'll apply these ideas to percentages and extend to multiple groups.